All right, guys, welcome to another edition of the Slay at Home Speaker Series. You can tune in every Thursday night this season at 6 p.m. We've got a wide variety of awesome topics and great panelists, all related to traveling in the backcountry. So uh, big you know, educational program that we're doing this season and uh, lots more great topics. We are taking a little break. Uh, for Christmas coming up. So tune in again in January. Uh, we'll have a whole nother list of great topics, uh, really focusing on terrain discussions around the United States and even some other great places. So make sure you tune in. You can follow all the different Slay at Home speaker series. You can watch our different episodes. They've all been recorded. So you can check those out on our website, um, westinbackcountry.com. You can also Check out our Facebook page, Weston, there on Facebook, and it's got all of our different uh, videos recorded there. So looks like we got a lot of great uh, people tuning in. We have a ton of Colorado here tonight. I'm seeing New Hampshire, Utah, even saw Pennsylvania, and, and we've got a, another great crew from our fine friends in the Great White North up in Canada. Thanks again for tuning in this evening. We've got a great presentation for you this evening. Um, tonight and, and every Slay at Home speakers is sponsored by the fine folks at Weston. We're based here in Minturn, Colorado, small um, outdoor backcountry product producer. We make skis, split boards, uh, snowboards, really kind of known for our split boards and, and our skis are, are definitely um, an up and coming product. So check out that stuff again on our website. The other major sponsor for this evening is Silverton Avalanche School, um, one of the longest running avalanche schools in the United States. Um, these guys do everything. Um, great, great program down there. Our topic is the human factor. So we have discussed a variety of different uh, topics this season from where to get your gear, what kind of avalanche education you need. And now we're kind of getting into, you know, the last and arguably the most important thing that you need to be thinking about if you're traveling in the backcountry, and that is, you know, how you as a human come into play. What are the things that you do um, that you really need to be looking a little bit closer at if you're going to be traveling in avalanche terrain? So heuristic traps are, are kind of what we re refer to those things as, but um, you know, I am your host, Ben. I'm the brand experience manager here at Weston. I run all of our educational programs and, and also have the great privilege of working on our design team. I also get to manage our team of great professional mountain guides. So we have, you know, arguably the biggest team of mountain guides um, in the nation, you know, that I know of. And that's really who we try to focus on. So Michael Ackerman is, is one of our amazing guide team members, potentially even one of our first guides that we had, um, you know, on a Western board and in our program. And he is just, you know, arguably the man in backcountry education here in Colorado. And um, he's just been a vital asset to us since day one. So Michael, you know, thanks so much for tuning in th this evening and help us, helping us out on this webinar. I know we've got a, a lot of excited people to kind of learn from you. Um, and so I'll kind of kick it over to you now, buddy. And just again, thanks so much for doing this. We're, we're stoked to have you, man. Awesome, Ben. Thanks for having me and everybody out there. Uh, this is truly an honor. This presentation tonight is going to be about the human factor. And for me as an educator, it's one of the most exciting, uh, if not most fun topics to riff about. So I'm excited to talk at you for a little bit and then hopefully pollinate your thinking so that we engage a little bit at the end uh, of this presentation. So to that end, uh, just an agenda uh, for this evening. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Avalanche Triangle. And in doing that, I'll talk a little bit about myself and Silverton Avalanche School. Uh, we'll jump right into the human factor, what that is, uh, and heuristic traps, these subconscious behavioral pathways uh, that are both good and bad. Uh, typically bad when we have ourselves in terrain of consequence and we act impulsively. And then we'll talk about some tools. I like to think of them as guardrails uh, that we like to utilize to keep ourselves from falling into the pitfalls that we might uh, commonly encounter as being a creative silly ape. Uh, and then we'll open it up for a little generative dialogue at the end here. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, 
the idea, the basic premise for this, and if you're offended, I, I guess you should just log off now because it's not going to be a good night for humans. Uh, humans are, are silly, emotional, ego-driven creatures uh, who do what they want to do, uh, say what they want to say, uh, often in spite of very objective uh, inputs and in data. And we all do dumb things. Uh, we all make these mistakes. That's uh, what makes us human. The interesting uh, kerfuffle that we find ourselves in is when we do these silly human tricks in terrain of consequence, uh, very quickly we could have a problem on our hands. That next slide, Ben. So uh, a little bit about me. Um, I have been in avalanche education for uh, a bit now. And it's interesting that, that as advanced as we get with 21st century tools and techniques and uh, technologies, we always ground ourselves with kind of the learning, understanding and wisdom from the past. So I wanna start us this evening by going back in time, like we do at the Silverton Avalanche School, to the Avalanche Triangle. And the Avalanche Triangle is a basic uh, four-part graphic organizer. On the outside of the Avalanche Triangle, we've got snowpack, weather, and terrain. Uh, weather is what weather is. If it's snowing, we say it's snowing. Uh, the snowpack can present with problematic leak layers or melt freeze crust, things that are very observable and objective. Uh, terrain, the most important thing we can control as recreationalists. If safety and stability is the question, terrain is always the answer. This is very objective stuff. So if we can look at the backcountry and we can look at the mountains very objectively and use a tool like the avalanche triangle to make decisions, to uh, do route finding, to conceive tour plans, how come we can go out in the face of objective inputs and still get into trouble? It's because of that circle in the middle of the triangle, the fourth consideration, and that's us, the humans. And so, as we mentioned before, we're gonna do what we wanna do and we're gonna, Think what we want to think. The problem is in the mountains, mother nature is always going to bat last. And she's often fond of hitting a walk-off in the ninth inning, just when you have the victory all sewn up, or at least you think you do. We don't get things right out there. We just don't get it wrong enough. And we can develop a complacency. We can develop subconscious beliefs, attitudes, opinions, uh, behavioral pathways based upon negative feedback loops. When I ski a slope, I don't ski a slope and a little woodland elf jumps out of the trees and is like, Eck, you got that right. What happens when I get it right? Nothing happens. And so I'm building this bedrock of understanding that could have been luck or just missing a likely trigger point. Uh, so we start to imprint these behavioral pathways, and there's a reason why we do that. This touches upon these ideas of heuristics. So in 2002, Ian McCammon, he was a Knowles instructor, avalanche educator, and now he's uh, become really one of the, one of the uh, I'd say, leaders, thought leaders within the world of avalanche education. Uh, kind of in the more contemporary nowadays, 90s, 2000s, and 21st century. And he released this paper in uh, 2002, which introduced us to uh, thinking about heuristic traps uh, as the, uh, the main driver of the human factor. And it ultimately led to some tools we're going to look at. But first, we'll start with what are heuristics? Heuristics are subconscious behavioral pathways that we use to make our complex multi-dimensional lives more manageable. So check it out. I can't see any of you, but I'm sure all of you have pants on right now. I mean, I guess that's what we can get away with on Zoom, but when you put on your pants this morning, this afternoon, this evening, 
did you think about which leg you were going to put in first? And did you say to yourself, okay, Michael, balance on one leg, bend down, pick up garment, open wide, or did you just subconsciously put on a pair of pants? That's a heuristic. That's a behavioral impression that we use daily to make our lives easier. Imagine if you had to think about everything you were going to do, pick up pen, open notebook, it would be exhaustive and we would get one iota of things accomplished. We'd be uh, marginally as efficient as we are now uh, in our modern day lives. And this all comes from uh, people that we are related from, no matter what race, what color, what creed, we all came from uh, individuals that were much more connected uh, to the, themselves, the planet, their tribe mates. And if they had to think about the woolly mammoth coming into the cave, they had to think about bend down, pick up rock, reach arm back, throw at mammoth. If they had to think about all of those actions, uh, your DNA, like you wouldn't be here today. They developed these subconscious behavioral pathways to react and be proactive in the face of an invading predator. And if they didn't, they and their tribe mates didn't exist to make you. So you're here today because the heuristic pathways that your ancestors imprinted served you well. There's this funny thing in avalanche education where we're like, avalanche is bad. But the reality is an avalanche is just a natural process. It's neither good nor bad. And it's when we introduce humans into that natural process that we can tend to get all judgmental and we're like, oh, it's bad because it hit me or it took my partner or far worse. That's the same thing with heuristics. Heuristics are neither good nor bad. Uh, we wouldn't be able to exist as the successful species that we are uh, if heuristics were not of benefit to us. But again, utilizing heuristics, impulsive, reactive uh, behavioral pathways in terrain of consequence uh, could get us into trouble. This is a tool that McCammon suggested after he unpacked the idea of heuristics in that kind of lodestar paper in this part of the triangle. Uh, that paper, that presentation at ISSW has shaped how curriculum has been created to address the human factor pretty much since the 2000s. And the tool probably many of you have seen and that we often introduce students to in recreational programming is this uh, facets mnemonic. So familiarity, acceptance, consistency or commitment or complacency, the expert halo, tracks and scarcity, and then social facilitation or social proof. Um, this mnemonic is really great because we are ego and emotion driven creatures. And if we can pump the brakes and get ourselves to think about what am I doing right here that's gonna influence what happens next, facets is a nice little checklist to run through mentally to uh, pump the brakes on the human factor. So let's unpack these a little bit if you haven't seen them or check back in with these ideas uh, if you haven't seen them in a little bit. So the acronym is FACETS. It's a nod to our negative metamorphic, see what I did there? Our metamorphic change to the square, right? In the snow world, it's not hip to be square or to be a facet. So FACET is the acronym and the first one is familiarity. And so the idea behind familiarity is that I know this terrain. I ski this terrain, I ride this terrain, I climb up and down this train on every day that ends with Y. I know it. Well, I can tell you uh, after doing this work and believing some things to be true about avalanches, it only took the winter of 2019 to really show us that we don't know anything about anything. Uh, in my work, uh, the longer I get into this field, the more I know, the less I feel I know, and the more I want to understand. And familiarity is this human trap where it's like, I know it, I got it. 
And all it takes, you know, it's like, we didn't think we could have D5 avalanches in Colorado. And all it takes is three of them to come ripping down a couple marches ago to be like, oh, everything we thought we knew is now wrong. So familiarity can really bite us when it comes to our terrain selection, terrain management, or even our tour planning before we're even into or at the trailhead. The next one is acceptance. Acceptance takes many forms, uh, but it is all social. So it could be uh, at the real micro level of what's happening within your group. So you and your group have this sunk cost objective. You've spent all morning climbing up the ridge of the side of the witch's cauldron, and now it's time to shred the gnar. And you're up there, and you're looking at these folks that just put in a really strong effort and are counting on you to kind of soldier up and make that descent. And you're probably going to be less likely to speak up if you've kind of accepted your fate in that moment. There's also the need to be accepted. There's also the need to feel like I'm not holding the group back or I'm not going to be the one that's going to voice concerns. What I found as a professional is that if somebody's thinking it, three other people are thinking it. And it's wise to have those voices uh, profiled. Typically, I will say to a group, it takes all to go and one to know. And I will create the space for acceptance before we launch into the backcountry. There are external pressures on us, though, that lead to this acceptance part of the acronym. And that is the social proof or the social acceptance that we get via social media. Um, I like to pick on GoPro a lot. Uh, the slogan of GoPro, right? Be a hero. It's been great job security for search and rescue teams and uh, professionals like myself. Uh, you just give somebody a camera and tell them to be a hero and, and boy, haven't they. Um, and I'm sure I'm not telling anybody like, Nobody's watching my shaky GoPro footage, like on, you know, maybe mom, she thinks I'm really cool, but it's, uh, people do silly things when the camera's rolling, or it's always funny to me when I'll have clients out in the mountains in my capacity, in my role as a mountain guide, I'll come back to town, I'll, I'll go into the avalanche, the local bar here, and people will be like, hey, Eck, those were great turns up on Buttercup Mountain, and I will ponder for a moment, like, were you in the bushes? Like, what was, how did you know we were up there? And it's because the clients, the people I was with were like real time data tweeting their geo tags of what they were doing. Um, and that's gotta be driven by a little bit of this acceptance heuristic. In the back country, the ego is never our amigo. Guilty is charged, but this want to be accepted both within the group uh, and within the greater tribe is a powerful motivator for ill-fated decisions and uh, poor choices. Consistency and commitment. I love this. I love this picture. Always open and now it's closed. We've come this far. We might as well go all the way. Like this is that sunk cost I was talking about on the last slide. Like you've accepted your fate because you are committed to the group's goals. Uh, I am going to go ski the witch's cauldron this weekend. That's a scary schedule to apply against Mother Nature because Mother Nature is not operating on your nine to five weekend warrior paradigm. Uh, the witch's cauldron will be okay to ski at some point. It's going to be on a schedule that maybe does not mesh with your, with your job or your family commitments or uh, that commitment and that inflexibility to uh, a, a goal or a vision, uh, yes, it brings about brilliance. And yes, that's how we push grades and do amazing things. Uh, but it can also lead us down a really dark and dangerous slope very quickly. You have this idea about summit fever. And this is really interesting to me. Um, I think it's easier the more time you spend in the backcountry and you know you're going to come out like tomorrow and the next day you get into this rhythm and this groove of like yeah this stuff is going to be here it has been here for the millennia it will outlast me it will outlast my kin 
the summit is really only the most obvious place to turn around on any given sortie or excursion. Like that's all a summit is. Um, and it, I have much more uh, respect and uh, admiration for the travelers that can make the turnaround be the turnaround, meaning it is what it is because it, it should be, not because it's some fixed goal or some uh, rigid commitment that we've set in the coffee shop um, and that's what we're doing with our day. Um, and the consistency ties into this. It's another way to shape the C in the acronym of, it touches on the familiarity, but it's the consistency of doing something over and over again, that it also leads to the third C. We, I don't have this written on the slide here, which is also complacency. Um, so we get familiar, we auger into consistency or a perception of things that are the same all the time, like Denny's is always open. And then that leads to complacency and complacency is what kills us in the back country. <laughs> the expert halo. So here he is talking tonight. It's really funny doing uh, courses, maybe level twos or pro courses and talk about the human factor, which definitely doesn't get a lot of uh, press in the pro world. We do a lot of science. We do a lot of train management as well we should. But there is definitely a nod I like to give to pro students, which is, hey, we're gonna do this test on terrain management right now. And if I wanted to walk you all to your deaths, you would all do so willingly with a smile because that's what the program calls for. Let's go out and let's engage in terrain. The reality is if you embrace the fact that we don't get it right, we just don't get it wrong enough, no one out there is getting it right. Within the idea of the snowpack and the avalanche triangle is an idea of spatial variability. So if those of you that have had training can think of what's happening in the snow here is not what's happening in the snow here. And it's not what's happening in the snow here. It's spatially variable across the landscape. People's attitudes, opinions, assessments are equally spatially variable. And what I might know to be true one day may not be true the next. A wise snowhound once said, we never ski the same run twice. And that's absolutely true from a, a real meta standpoint to a real micro standpoint to the snowflakes that I've now skied upon are now subjected to metamorphic change just because of the friction of my snowboard. So it's this idea that because Ack is out there doing it 365, he somehow knows the way. Um, that's a really easy trap to get caught into. I would say it's probably the danger profile I'm most susceptible to. Uh, and when I pick my head up and I look around and I do a real honest assessment of self and turn the mirror, um, you know, it's funny the stories we tell ourselves. We are ego and emotional driven creatures and we're gonna do what we wanna do. And sometimes being like, I'm the snow guy, uh, it, it can get you into a trap. I also try to remind myself that I'm also the snow guy because everybody had this job in front of me is either dead or has like burnt out because of the stress and anxiety of it all. So, so and so knows more about this zone than anybody. You hear anybody rapping like that, I, I'd be very weary. Um, the backcountry is always telling us a story. And our job is to go out there and listen. It's a journey. It's not a destination. We're always listening. It's not about going it out and figuring it out and checking a box. And suddenly, I'm the snow pro. The only reason I'm the snow pro is I probably like fail getting like monthly checkups and building my bank account because I'm spending a lot of time in the woods just watching and listening and trying to understand like what it all means. And that's the expert angle I try to bring to work with my clients and my students, not this come follow me up the, you know, monster's gut. Let me wipe your nose, tie your shoes and we will crush. This is so funny not talking to anybody but the screen. So tracks and scarcity. Puppies, who doesn't love puppies? Man, let's get the goods before somebody else does. I'm sure there's not a person on this webinar 
who has not experienced the joy of no friends on a powder day. And there is this weird uh, ego fueled, mostly internal competition that we play with ourselves to get first tracks. I used to think this was really funny uh, uh, when I was a ski patroller. You would, you know, people would jostle and throw fisticuffs to be first in line or leave their kit there and argue whether or not that's like etiquette or not or, or whatever. And then I'm like, but, but patrol is getting first tracks, you know, since we got here at 4 a.m. And then the dirt bag that hiked up at 3 a.m. got first tracks before us all. So it's just like a paradigm. And I think about this idea of tracks and scarcity, and I got to get it before somebody else as uh, a power and control dynamic. I like to relate it to road rage. So I grew up in Boston and let's just say like when the streets back there all are three one ways and they all come to a do not enter, the infuriation builds and builds and builds and that road rage becomes a part of like who you are. Uh, but that'll take over your life and you'll get all sick and twisted. So you got to figure out a way to get past that. And uh, the way I've done it is to think about it as like a power and control investment. So when somebody cuts me off in traffic, I got two choices. I can get all angry, and get up on their bumper and like do the rap hands and, you know, all that stuff. Or I can just be like, wow, that's a perfect stranger that is obviously a shitty driver. I'm just going to like back off, let them go their own way. I'm going to make a choice not to give my power away. That's what's happening on the skin track. So I can personify, I can create, I can uh, delude myself into thinking there's this great competition for these stellar crystals that fell from the sky and there's a shortage of them. And if I just don't get those stellar crystals and carve my S across that canvas before those other guys, I am less of a human being. Like that is some weird mental construct I've created that is ego and emotionally driven. And ultimately I've given my power away. I've given my power away when I accept the consequences. And I've given my power away when I get complacent. I've given my power away when I'm chasing tracks and thinking this is all scarce. Because guess what? It's going to melt kids and then it's going to come back. And then somebody's going to get first tracks then. And then you'll get first tracks the next day. It's when you take a more, uh, like a higher elevation view on all of this, it's a journey, not a destination. And if you can be out there experiencing it, um, like, uh, soapboxy, but that's why I'm out there. Like the turns are great, but it's really the experience of it all. It's being connected to the natural world and kind of seeing my insignificance in it all that makes this sport so freaking rad. All right, let's move through this final couple too. Social facilitation. Yeah, everybody knows this. Tracks on a slope, the lines on the face, it must be safe. Um, all those tracks show us is that the person that skied that that skied the line before us did not get it wrong enough. They didn't get it right. And you could have stacked tracks. We see this all the time when we train mountain guides and snow professionals. Um, because of that spatial variability of snowpack that I mentioned before, you could have a snowpack that's at depth, at depth, at depth, at depth, and then uh, a change to that depth because a rock comes out of the ground. And all of a sudden we've moved up a potential trigger point, a weak layer, nothing good happened around geology. We've changed the depth of that snow. It's become spatially variable. And after the one, two, three, four, five, the sixth person goes, they hit that not so sweet spot and rock and roll. They've awakened the monster in the horror film. So social facilitation, social proof, other people doing things, it just means those other knuckleheads did not get it wrong enough. I can't stress that enough. All right, what do you got on this next one? Perfect. That's facets. So facets is this tool that we use to very quickly check in with uh, what's going on. Uh, it's been designed uh, to use 
when the defecation is hitting the oscillation. So when it's blowing sideways and it's hard to hear your partner, we can very quickly run through a checklist. What's interesting about facets that in the very same paper that McCammon gave us facets, he introduces some longitudinal study and some data that although humans do have these tools, the studies and his research show us that we will not use these tools or we are apt not to use these tools. So what I'd like to take us into uh, for a more generative uh, kind of critical thinking part of the program here tonight is I wanna set the tone with asking everybody on the webinar tonight to think about the guardrails that you're using. You as a recreationalist, what guardrail, what tool are you using to uh, protect against the human factor? And you can think about it in a couple different ways. So there are traditional tools. So if you've taken like an ARI 1 or an ARI 2, you learn how to use the DMF and generate inputs and create outputs and use that structure to ride safely and keep your group safe. Uh, there's also things that are more uh, decision-making at different decision points, things like the OutTruth uh, acronym or a uh, candidate, the evaluator. Specifically to the human factor, we've looked at facets tonight. Um, if anybody is a member of the AAA, the American Avalanche Association, uh, Lynn Wolf just, just posted uh, on their socials in the last 48 hours a link to Ed LaChapelle's uh, article, which is called The Ascending Spiral. It is another uh, one of those uh, just hallmark works within the field of uh, kind of human factors. And I'm not going to try to teach La Chapelle tonight, but if you get a chance, check out The Ascending Spiral and you can just Google that. It was part of the Avalanche Review, the American Avalanche Association. And if you're connected with them on the Instawebs, there's a link right to the article. But in this, uh, Ed breaks down the human factor as very simple things that we do over and over again until those repetitive pitfalls spiral to a trap. So we're like in the business before we realize we're in the business. And so in that article, he talks about liking the DeVito test, which is another uh, kind of evaluative tool rubric. As professionals, some of you may have been exposed to the strategic mindset model. So as a professional, when I'm putting out an operational plan in the morning, I'm going to set a mental guardrail for myself within the context of my operation. It's called strategic mindset. Oftentimes when we're working as avalanche educators, we're entrenched in assessment, meaning we're always going out and we're always looking at things and that's kind of what we do. If you end up like in an avalanche education course and it ends up being like hucking your meat off the eliminator, it's a much different strategic mindset that, than I'm used to applying. But as a ski guide, I'm gonna apply a strategic mindset that might be, okay, I'm gonna step out into terrain to get my clients the goods. But that's probably informed by the inputs of a forecaster, a snow safety team. Strategic mindset is great and we're introducing it at the level two uh, level of training. It can become a really good tool for recreationalists. Um, I'll give a little nod to the uh, yellow book or the Silverton Avalanche School, the nugget. Um, we've built strategic mindset into the human factor part of our uh, field notebook, but I'm fascinated and the frontier for us right now with this work is around that cognitive process. Uh, Dr. Laura McGuire uh, out of the University of Ohio, she's a Canadian uh, former ski guide. She's really pushing this idea of how could you truncate the uh, cognitive process down to a tool, a usable tool. And that's where I'd like to take the presentation this evening and is maybe hear from folks, what, what mental guardrails, think of it like this, when we ski terrain of consequence, we will often say, this is the train we think is problematic and we will add margins on each side of the terrain to keep us safe if we don't get it wrong enough. So if we do get it wrong, we're gonna make a bad decision wisely and expand that buffer of safety. 
what buffer of safety are you using? What tools out there are people using to keep themselves safe? Here's an example. Uh, a buddy of mine who puts the picture of his family laminated on the top sheet of his deck. So before he drops into anything, that's one of the things he checks in with. Um, I like to ask people based upon who you are and what you're all about and the cumulative experience of your fill in the blank that with their age, years on this planet. Are you willing to cash it all in on this 800 foot section of, of snow? Um, I like to use more generative, more open-ended questions just to get people to think about based upon who they are and what they're all about. What are they gonna do to proceed here? So I think that's a good, maybe just pausing point to get some ideas from folks and maybe we can riff about those ideas that we're getting in the Q and A. Does that work, Kelly? Absolutely. Um, feel free to, to type in any, um, you know, guardrails that you guys currently use. Um, if you are already backcountry enthusiasts, um, they're in the chat. And uh, I can pass them on to Ak here. <laughs> yeah. Sean Eno says he does the pencil test. <laughs> to see uh, if his uh, if a pencil will fit in his butt cheeks because it's like so the human cool. hardness, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, I, oh, I see Matt's comment. There. I visualize the slope sliding. Um, I think many of you guys know, uh, you know, uh, definitely like a lodestar and light uh, that came before me at Silverton Avalanche School, Doug Kraus, and a contemporary of mine nowadays. Uh, howdy, Ryan Howe. These guys love to frame risk assessment and human factor uh, in terms of like, how much you got on the table? How much do you have in? Uh, what's your bet? What's your bid? Are you willing to go all in on this? Um, and then when you start to hedge your bet a little bit, it's actually kind of a barometer to be like, oh, I'm thinking about things, either spoken or unspoken. And I should Check in with that. That's a that's the canary in the coal mine for the human factor. Some of these other ones, Ben. Wow, these are good. Could I explain this decision? Yeah, the counterfactual. Um, I like to call these essential questions. Here are some that, uh, that we often ask students to ask of themselves when they're thinking about the human factor and they're setting up their guardrails. So first and foremost, what's your goal? What are you out there for? And what is your group's goal? If you have goals that are non-aligned, you are barreling uh, towards a pickle very quickly. What is an acceptable level of risk for you? This can be a really tough conversation. It's better to have it beforehand uh, than in the field, before that sunk cost, before you've accepted your fate. Um, my level of risk changes day to day, objective to objective and year to year. Uh, I think about the stuff that should have gotten me killed or in jail long ago. And I don't want anything to do with it right now. And I wanna make sure I'm not out with a group that fits that risk profile. Um, other stuff, like how are you gonna make decisions? Often groups won't talk about that. Are you, you know, it could boil down to how you process information. Like what's your particular communication and learning style? Do you need to, hear things out loud in order to process them and make the best decision? Or are you somebody that likes is more analytical so you like to gather the inputs and then go internal and then process and produce a decision? Um, if people's rate of information processing is uh, different or it happens at a different speed, it can cause friction and it can cause the group to make impulsive, rash, ego, decisions. That's the human factor right there. These are all really, really good. They're coming in fast. 
Let's see, everybody has a voice. Yeah, the all it takes all to go and one to know is a is a really nice little sassism that we like to use. Um, we know that statistically, uh, a group of three is the ideal for decision making, uh, and then it goes to four, and then it goes to two, and then everything outside of those parameters we'll just say is less than ideal. And that's because in a group of three, we naturally balance the three-legged tripod of all members' voices. And it's hard to have a tie that isn't broken. And typically in three, you have a nice dynamic uh, sounding board, if you will. With two partners, you can get into an echo chamber. And then as we start to get larger than four, when we're getting to groups of five and six and a couple dogs, I'm just not sure how you include all voices. I'm not sure how, how all teammates have agency when you're trying to facilitate a, a gathering of that many people in terrain of consequence. Um, here's a go. How do you define risk or see other people doing it? Act Maybe some good starter questions to hone in on from Sean. Um, that's a good question. So how do I define risk? So there's two types of risk. There's perceived risk and there's actual risk. And so actual risk is like, I am ascending the 50 foot or 50 degree couloir underneath the overhanging Serac on Denali. And that thing could fall and wipe out all 50 of us. Like very perceivable uh, risk, it's there. Uh, it's tangible, but, but these perceived risks are like, this could happen. And in a game where we get very little feedback when we supposedly get it right, um, it's, hard to, it's hard to know like, was that risky? Was that not risky? There are days where mother nature uh, advertises her risk in a blinking neon sign. I think we've just had a recent week of that. Uh, you know, the other day, we're skinning and you couldn't go 50 steps down here in the North San Juans without remotely triggering a face or sending a rumbling crack. The risks were right there, blinking yellow. Uh, and hopefully blinking red for us not engaging, but blinking yellow, like really slow down, think about this silly human. It's when those perceived risks come down to like being not as glaring or not as overt that then I have to turn to my partner and I have to have some sort of either conversation of substance or conversation of courage to actually define like why I think this is risky. And what I promote teams, what I really advocate all of you to do is have that conversation about what is acceptable for risk. Like I'm going out there to huck my meat and ski 50 degrees, come hell or high water to get the footy, to shred the gnar, uh, you know, to just be like totally stoked. Or there's some folks like me who are like, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I'd like to go out, get a nice powder turn or two, maybe chase a bunny. Um, and wow, beautiful sky. I'm like that's my risk profile for today. If you check in with that beforehand, you typically don't have to have those tussles at the top of the convexity or at the top of the witch's cauldron. Um, so defining that risk by what is acceptable to me today based upon these conditions, based upon where I'm at and where, what I'm all about right now. Um, I think that's the bedrock conversation you have with your, with your partners and you go from there. Um, describe risks you're comfortable. I'd like to know more how you describe it. I hope that nailed it right there. If not, we can, risk is like a whole nother webinar. Um, having clear conversations with day. Yes, yes, totally on point there, John. Like. If you are a backcountry recreationist, you might only be able to ski on Saturday and Sunday. But if you are a backcountry split border skier, if that is who you are, your head needs to be in that game uh, 365. That is your identity each and every day. So even if I'm not on snow, I'm waking up, I'm checking in with my home turf, the place that I consider where I go to recreate. What did the weather do there? Uh, looking at telemetry sites, reading the Abbey Bulletin, whether I'm on snow or not. 
I'm hiking those slopes in the summertime. I'm mountain biking in the spring. I'm going hunting in the fall. I'm creating this intimate relationship with a chunk of real estate, a chunk of mountain, a chunk of backcountry uh, that I watch change over time. And so when I talk about uh, having a conversation, like the conversation doesn't start Saturday morning in the coffee shop or as we're like hardly trying to fill out some tour plan before we lose reception or all the G's on the highway. Um, it can start like Monday, like, okay, we went out yesterday and now I'm all wrapping with my friends and I'm debriefing the weekend. And maybe Tuesday we back off and scratch it and we get on Cal Topo. And we start thinking about like, yeah, based upon what this weekend was, based upon this crew and my resources and how I'm feeling, this is what I wanna do maybe next weekend. But then I'm having that conversation with my partners on Wednesday, we're refining and reflecting on Thursday and probably on Friday, we're putting together a pretty solid mission profile in our, in our tour plan or some sort of organizer. Um, but it's, it's a journey, it's not a destination. It's not like I just do it here, then I go out and then I leave it. And then I go out the next time and do it. That's a real, like you're just rolling the dice. Um, this sport that we all do, or if you're getting into it that you want to do, for me, that's been the, the greatest gift of it is that it is engagement and it's stimulating all the time. Um, I'm always thinking about snow. I'm always thinking about the mountains, always thinking about the weather, always thinking about the terrain. And I'm always thinking about like what I want to do and what mother nature wants to do to me in it all. And um, like, that's to me, the real gift of, of engaging in this. And if you make that your rhythm of your business, uh, even if you're only getting out once or twice, you're gonna be in it. You're gonna be connected to the tribe. Um, it, it's like a blessed gift, I think in 2020, which not a lot of cool things are going on. All right. Um, I don't know, Ben, what do I got here? Any, any good ones I missed or? That's coming up. Okay, let's uh, jump in the Q&A real quick, too. I think we got one there. Oh, Sean, that was Sean. How do you define risk or see other people doing it? You know, and how do you communicate that to your partners? You know, for me, I'm, I'm constantly talking, you know, um, to my partners and we're discussing the snowpack. You know, did you hear that warmth? Did you, you know, it, it, did you feel that weak layer? And so, at the at the end of our day, it, it's it's not a surprise to anyone the decisions that we're making. You know, it's like, oh, we've you know that's the third red flag we've seen today. It shouldn't be a you know like where are you coming from with this issue? Like it's like, oh yeah, like we've discussed that three times. We all saw this coming, right? Like you were saying, yeah. if you're thinking something, three three other people probably are too. And it's just, I think, you know, for me, it's just being able to communicate with those partners and knowing that I'm out with a good crew of people and that I, I have that voice. And if, if, if I don't feel comfortable writing something, I'm not going to, you know, have repercussions, you know, socially because of it. People are going to be like, sure. yeah, like we all agree because we've been talking about it. This isn't a surprise to any of us. Exactly. Exactly. And it probably the journey that you're on with that team and those partners is longer than that one mission. And if you can, and if you can see it as that journey, um, that's, that's the, that's the real give back to you. You know, it's, it's almost self recharging. It's like, okay, we didn't get it because we went out and we experienced this. Now we know this, we can more comprehensively plan around this. And when we encounter it next time, we'll be better equipped. I mean, that is a magical process to go through with a partner or some teammates. Uh, I think, you know, not to get too ethereal here, right, but everybody's coming in the back country now because they're feeling connected to the natural world. They're feeling connected to each other. Like 2020 really drove home this point of like, this is what matters and this is not what matters. And if we can just play on that synergy of that connection, right, the backcountry is always telling us a story. It's like, whether we choose to listen or not, all the information is right there for us. And the more information we and our partners can take in and listen and read and share with each other, 
the more informed actions, decisions, and behaviors we're going to make. That's the secret sauce. It's the secret sauce to staying safe in the backcountry. It's not an expert telling you what to do. It's go out and listen to what's happening. Mother Nature is showing us. Ben, you mentioned the red flags. That's a, a huge important thing to check in with. If you're hitting three or more red flags and the humans are still talking themselves into a decision, I like to say you're fighting your way into the bar. We never fight our way into the bar. We only fight our way out of the bar when we've made a mistake. Unless you're Jesperson, then you just <laughs> right into that bar. Yeah, Silver, Silverton, you guys do it a little differently. A little bit. The 1880s are alive and well down here. We'd love to see everybody down here. So, Ak, um, again, man, thanks so much for presenting tonight. How can people get a hold of you um, if they want to learn more, you know, if they want to come out on a sick guided tour down in Silverton? Sure. Um, so you can find me at the Silverton Avalanche School. Uh, we're online at avyschool.com. Uh, uh, we opened, just a little history of the school, we opened in 1962 when Sheriff Virgil Mason approached the graduate students from the University of Colorado who are working the INSTAR, the Arctic Snow and Ice uh, project here in Silverton. And we're like, we get people going to get groceries and avalanches are taking out their driveway and then they're digging back into their homes. Like we should probably figure out what to do as a little mountain hamlet. So rescue was our start in 62 and in 2022, we celebrate 60 years of doing this. Um, we run all sorts of programming that we're super stoked to offer recreational programming, just being one of a big slice of other things, pro programs, tactical, industrial, um, you know, a typical day for me is rapping about stuff like this and then hustling out and forecasting either for the railroad or the mine uh, and then coming back and doing some sort of like weather obs or data dump with pros. So as an educator and as a school, it's super stimulating. Lots of programs going on from people making maps to people throwing bombs to people, you know, just all sorts of applications. So whatever your uh, on-ramp is into the snow education journey, there's an avenue for you to push it forward at the school. We're not uh, you know, I guide as a mountain guide for other companies and that, you know, talk about human factor that really feeds the ego. It's like, oh, they still want me and people still want to go skiing with me. Um, uh, and that stuff's all well and good at the school. What we want to do is just figure out where you're at in your educational journey and then just push you to go even further to kind of meet your mission profile. So if you're a recreationalist, we're super hype on the level two and kind of the stuff that we're calling pro curious. We have a lot of recreationalists poking around the pro world and they get over there and they're like, this ain't that cool. And it's like, no, because you want to do this stuff that's been designed for you over here. So uh, just being involved in all that's a super honor. Um, I do have an Instagram now. Uh, I think I'm the splitboarding hermit on the Insta pages. So say hi um, there. It's a foreign world for me. Yeah, that's me. It's a super honor. I know people get the holidays coming up and we've gone through a lot of these. I've watched a couple of these slay at homes and uh, just kind of coming in here before Christmas, feel super honored. Thanks Weston having me and come down and see us. You really have to want to come to Silverton, uh, but I promise uh, what happens here stays here. Silverton will be your Vegas shortly if you get yep. down here. I can't think of you know many places I would rather take some avalanche education um, you know, for over a decade, Silverton has been, you know, a Mecca for us, you know, and I mean, we used to take our team trips there every single yeah. year, yeah. book a cabin on Red Mountain Pass, you know, go to Silverton Split Fest, you guys look that up, you know, I doubt it's going to go down this year, but, you know, every, every year, it's, it's one of the longest running Split Fests in the U.S., and it's just an epic destination. So anyone, you know, tuning in here in Colorado or the rest of the U.S. or even abroad, you know, consider a destination trip this season. Um, Silverton is a wonderful small community, um, plenty of room to socially distance, um, and I'm sure that they would welcome, you know, the business there in town for sure. Um, 100%. 100%. We'd love to have you in the caldera. There's a bunch of great organizations here. Combine some guiding with some avi ed with a day at the mountain. I mean, it truly is a bucket list 
locale. Just be really safe driving here. Yep. Oh yeah. And there was the million dollar highway, isn't it? Isn't, I mean, that's one of the most beautiful roads I've ever seen. They've most got beautiful, the most dangerous. I love it. More, yeah. More job security for search and rescue. Yep. 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 Well, all right, brother. Any last minute questions you guys have? Let us know. We've got Ackerman here for another few minutes um, and we will kind of sign off here shortly, but let us know if you got any last minute questions here. Uh, we will kind of keep answering them. And then if you know you don't have any other questions, just uh, make sure you tune in. Our next episode, I believe, is January 7th. We've got a really cool discussion with some local authors. Um, Ackerman mentioned Josh Jesperson, another Silverton Avalanche School Guide, also the world record, record holder for summiting and skiing all of Colorado's 14ers. He'll be joining us to discuss a little bit um, about his local projects, including Journey Lines, um, which is a really, really cool project he's been working on for years. We've also got Fritz Sperry and Josh Kling, two, two more of our amazing Weston writers to discuss their books. Fritz is a great local author. Um, his series, Making Turns, I own every one of. Um, really, really cool guidebooks. And then Josh is the guy who you know helped write the book on Silverton. Um, so really cool beacon guidebook there and just three, three more amazing personalities, really cool panelists. We're, we're really stoked on having. And um, again, Ackerman, thanks so much, brother. It is, it is always a pleasure. We, you are uh, just a great educator and we encourage anyone, um, you know, get, get a hold of this guy. If you can, if you can get them, um, otherwise get, get a hold of Silverton Avalanche School um, and get down there. It's just an epic, epic place. And they are just, the tops or when it comes to avalanche education in, in our community. So we're stoked to have you and yeah, thanks again for tuning awesome. in. Let's see if I've got any last minute questions. Pretty much everyone just saying how awesome you are. Oh, appreciate it, everybody. Appreciate oh, it. yeah. It says one last quote. Oh, I got one last one in the Q and a hold Brand, on. Brand. Boom. Oh, now I can see it. Whatever you just did there. Yeah. You got it. It says, you know, how does your acceptable acceptable risk level you're willing to take change if you're alone? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, like we do go out alone. So don't, you know, like you're going to go to an avalanche education course and you're going to be like, get a partner and all of that. Um, but the reality is to speak honestly to that, we do end up going alone. Uh, I defer a lot to Although I'm wearing a beacon and carrying a shovel and probe because I might encounter uh, a problem with somebody else or another party, I'm not gonna dig myself out. Um, I try to operate like that stuff doesn't exist for me. So if safety, stability, and solo is the question, terrain is always the answer. So if I'm out solo, um, you, know, you know, I don't wanna judge anybody for doing that because one, uh, you know, one woman's exercise routine is another woman's Everest. And it's not for me to judge what your mission profile is. Um, but if you are going to rock that terrain, 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 it's like 28 degree hippie soul turns all day with a plan. Somebody knowing that plan back in Babylon is looking out for me, um, probably rocking a spot device, but yeah, let's be transparent. Uh, Sometimes we want to get out and sometimes alone is, is a really blessed time. So I, I defer to a risk uh, management strategy that's all about low angle, uh, not doing, keeping it well below the threshold of, of challenge, keeping it very simple. Awesome. Well, killer buddy. I think- Awesome, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah. Happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas, Festivus, Kwanzaa, all the stuffs. And- uh, I think we're going to make it out of 2020 here, barely. Yeah, buddy. Awesome. Well, awesome gang. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, we will see you at the next Slay at Home series. And every Thursday at 6 p.m., check us out. We'll see you on the next one.